Okay, I think we'll get started. Lots of you will probably trickle in shortly. Uh, just a reminder that there is a homework due this week. Lab is due next week. Okay. Uh, I have to go and check if the TA has created an upload uh, link for the homework on Moodle. Has anybody looked at that? It is, right? Okay, good. Uh, okay, so that should be set. So send in the homework, start on the labs. The exam coming up right after the lab is due. I will mean, announce the, it's an evening exam. I will announce the date and so on by email shortly once I have the room confirmation. Okay, uh, so keep up with the classes, the usual message. Uh, also, just periodic reminder of our no device policy. Most of you have been pretty good at not using it, but occasionally you, I see violation you've been hearing from me by email. So, so try not to pitch, uh, to keep up with the class. Okay, so just to give a recap for what we talked about last time was on threads. Okay, so I defined the notion of a thread. I explained how it generalizes the notion of a process. Okay, so a thread basically is a, a stream of execution or a control thread that we use through an address space. Process, when we say process, we mean typically a single threaded process can generalize that and allow multiple threads to share an address space. Okay, I mentioned what are user level threads and what are kernel level threads. Kernel level threads are threads for which the kernel provides explicit support. Okay, there is support in the kernel. Uh, so scheduling, thread management, all of those calls are uh, for thread management are handled as system calls. Scheduling is handled by the kernel. User level threads are handled by libraries that you link to the application. The kernel does not provide support for them. It cannot see the presence of threads and so on. Okay, so that's where we stopped last time. We are going to continue the discussion, talk about synchronization today. Okay, so before I start, uh, I'll start with our story, which I didn't uh, relate on Monday. <laughs> so this one is about the lost key. Okay, so the story goes as follows. So there is a guy, uh, it's late at night, it's dark, there's a guy looking for something on a, in a dark spot on the road. Okay. Uh, some uh, man comes along and he asks him, what are you looking for? He says, I lost my key and I'm looking for it. So he says, let me help you and the two of them start looking. Okay. And after a while, neither of them has found the key. So then the guy asks, the, the, the man asks the first guy, saying, are you sure you dropped the key here? Because it's dark, but we can see no trace of it. And the guy says, no, not quite, but I dropped it over there. And he points to a different location. So then the man asks, so why are you looking for it here if you drop the key there? So he says, this, this spot is under the lamppost, so there's better light here. So I decided to look for it here. Okay. So what's the moral of the story? Yes, the moral of the story is there may be things that look attractive even though the hard problem and the substance of what needs to be done is somewhere else. Okay, so don't get carried away by the hype and just do whatever the rest of the crowd is doing. Okay, so with that we will uh, sort of come back to the lecture. So today's topic is going to be on synchronization. Okay, we'll start with this too much milk example which I presume you saw in 2.30. Yes. Okay. So we will. I'll just recap that example. Okay. I toyed with changing it to too much beer, but it doesn't quite work. <laughs> so we'll keep it as too much milk. Okay. So, but uh, we'll use that and then build on what we need to do for synchronization. Right. So, we'll mostly a recap. Okay. Yeah, so this is the example that you've seen in 2:30 already. So uh, the problem is one where uh, you and your roommate have to solve the problem of ensuring that you have milk. So in your uh, dorm room or home or whatever. So this is a scenario, this timeline. So you arrive home, you look in the refrigerator and you see there is no milk. Right? So you then you leave for the grocery to buy milk. And then while you are gone, your roommate arrives and looks in the fridge and again there is no milk. And the uh, roommate also leaves for the grocery. So while your roommate is gone, you come back from the grocery and you buy a bought milk and whatnot. And you come home, put the milk in the fridge. A roommate comes back later uh, also with milk and now you have too much milk, okay, which is bad. 
Okay, you can imagine why the beer example doesn't work. You can never have too much beer. Okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> so now we will uh, think about what this has to do with synchronization. So clearly, you and your roommate have to coordinate to ensure that there isn't too much milk. Okay, this is a problem of synchronization. Okay, so you want to ensure that there are uh, operations that enable this cooperation. We will refer to that as synchronization. Here, the entities that are cooperating are threads can also have synchronization between processes, but we are not going to look at process synchronization in this class, only thread synchronization. Okay? And we will say that those operations have to be atomic, we will see why in a little bit. Okay? That's the first term you need to know. It is a simple terminology, I'm recapping what you may probably have heard of in the 2.30. Okay, mutual exclusion, okay? ensure that only one thread does something at a particular time and it ex excludes other thread from doing that same operation. Okay? So this is called exclusion, mutual exclusion. You are excluding other threads from performing an operation and you are performing at a given time. Okay? Critical section is another term that you need to know. It's a piece of code that only one thread can execute at a given time. Okay? We are going to use synchronization to implement critical section. In other words, when we do implement a critical section, a thread that's in that executing that piece of code has implemented or is using mutual exclusion to prevent other threads from uh, executing, which is only one thread can execute it at any given time. Okay? Locks, a mechanism that actually implements synchronization, it's a mechanism to prevent some other process from doing something. And you probably know locks already, so you have to use uh, the lock method before entering a critical section and unlock before leaving a critical section. Okay? And if, if you try to grab a lock when it's already in use, you will actually have to wait. Okay? So synchronization of any sort involves some form of waiting, as we will see. Okay? The goal of our lecture is not, I will of course reintroduce locks and semaphores and all of that. Uh, just so that we are all on the same page. But our goal here is to understand how to implement these primitives. In 2.30 you, you, you learned about them, you probably use them to write some code. Here we need to know what does the OS kernel need to provide in order to implement these primitives. So what OS support are needed is needed for synchronization. That's the goal here. Okay, so there will be some repetition, but then we will actually build on that background and try to look at OS level issues here. So we will basically try to understand synchronization using our too much milk example. And then I will show you how you can use OS level support to implement synchronization okay, of various sort. Okay, so, so let's first try to solve the problem of too much milk. This may again be a little bit of repetition, but we will use this example okay, because you're familiar. Okay, so we'll ask what are the properties you need to solve the too much milk problem? Okay. There are two kinds of properties, correctness properties you want to achieve. They are actually referred to as safety property and liveness properties. Okay. A safety property ensures that nothing bad happens in your code. Okay. A liveness property ensures that something good happens. Okay. You want both. If you just say I will just implement a safety property, so nothing bad happens, as a trivial solution to the too much milk problem. Okay. What is that solution? Okay, nobody but do nothing is a good way to solve the too much milk problem you will not have too much milk if you do nothing you will not have any milk okay that solves that uh, uh, so, sort of addresses the too much milk problem so you want something good to happen as, as well which is you have no milk somebody should buy milk that's called a liveness property okay? you want both you neither want too much milk okay? nor do you want no, no milk at all okay? so both of those will together ensure the correctness of the program because you could write threads that do nothing and they will nothing bad will actually happen in your code. Okay, nothing good will happen either. Okay? So we are going to use, uh, assume that load and store instructions are atomic, which they are on most uh, hardware. Okay, and we'll try to sort of write, think of pseudo code and see whether we can come up with a piece of code where both of those properties are satisfied, safety and liveness, okay? which is one person buys milk at a time and somebody buys milk. Okay, it will neither too much milk and that somebody actually buys it. So here is solution one. In this case, now we are going to assume that threads are implementing your too much milk solution, not people. Okay? So that's thread A code and that's threads B code. So thread A is simply saying if there is no milk and we are going to use nodes for the threads to 
coordinate with one another. If you don't coordinate, you cannot solve the problem. So the idea is you, if you decide to go buy milk, you're going to leave a note on the fridge saying, I have gone off to buy some milk. Okay, and you're going to use that note to coordinate. So you say, if there is no milk in the fridge and there is no note on the fridge, then you leave a note saying you're going to buy milk, you go buy milk and then you remove the note. Okay, thread B is going to use the same code. Okay, <coughs> so this could be a potential solution to the too much milk problem. Okay, now the question is, what might be wrong with this solution? So I'll say that is clearly wrong. Okay, yes. Um, this isn't necessarily a problem in like a real life scenario, but if the two threads were tried to try to access whatever variable is stored in the no note um, at the same time, they might not detect the note even as the other thread is leaving the note, so they would both go to get one note. Okay, so that's something to say. Um, Pretty much the same thing as he said, except it's not specific to one specific line. It's that they can both pass the if statement before either leave a note. Okay. So both of you have said the same thing, which is both threads can ex go past the if statement. Okay. And both of them can actually enter the uh, enter this code and both go and buy milk. Question is why do, do both threads actually go and uh, enter the if statement? Okay. What, how do the threads actually have to execute for that scenario to be true? Okay, yes. <coughs> Can you repeat what you said? Yes, one has to go before the other. Okay. So we have to, so, so now this is where all of our CPU scheduling background is going to happen. Okay, we'll assume that these two threads are actually being scheduled. There's only one processor. Okay? Multiprocessor case is not being used here. Okay, one processor, one core. We'll construct a way in which these threads are actually scheduled by the CPU okay? or the kernel, and you will see some bad properties. Okay? Let's assume that thread both threads are ready to run. Okay? Thread A actually gets to execute first. Okay? So when thread, so it's going to get a time slice, it's going to start running. Let's say it executes this statement here. If there is no milk and there is no note. Initially, let's say there's you're out of milk and nothing has run yet, so neither threads have left any note. So it executes this if statement and the condition is true, so it's going to actually enter the if. Okay? Good. Now we are going to assume that the time slice expires. Okay? The time slice expires, you are going to basically suspend the execution of thread A and pick another thread to run. Okay, that's what CPU scheduling does for us. Okay, so let's say your CPU scheduler now picks thread B to run. It's also ready to run. So it gets to run next. Okay, it's going to execute the same code. Okay, it's going to look at this if statement. There is no milk still. And there is no node because we haven't actually executed. Thread A hasn't yet executed the statement. It has basically just entered the if and at times has expired before it could ex execute the next statement. So it is here. Okay, so it's going to basically both of them have now entered the statement. Now bad things are going to happen. It doesn't matter what's how you schedule them because thread B is in the if statement, thread A is in the if statement. So either way they are going to actually start executing whatever is in the if and then you are essentially going to end up with too much milk. Okay. So thread synchronization or, or the reason we need synchronization is regardless of what the CPU scheduler does it whatever order you execute your thread you do not want bad things to happen okay? you shouldn't actually have to depend on a particular order of scheduling okay? there are times when this code will actually work okay? if the thread a runs and it executes this whole thing in one time slice okay? you are going to go buy milk there's no milk you there's no note you go leave a note you buy milk and so on and then thread b runs and it's not good you won't have any bad situation because there's already milk in this code may run correctly some of times, okay? but there are scenarios, if there's at least one scenario under which the code is actually not going to run, then the solution doesn't work. Okay? We want to have a scenario where no matter what happens, in what, no matter how, what CPU scheduling algorithm you use, okay, the code always runs the right way, never gives you violates either the safety or the uh, liveness property. Okay? So this is where we are actually going to use our CPU schedule. So I'm going to give extra other scenarios, okay, other, other code, and you have to ask, is can the CPU scheduler actually schedule these threads in some order and cause some problem? 
If yes, then the code is incorrect. Doesn't matter whether it runs right some of the time. Right? There's at least one scenario where it doesn't run, then we are essentially in trouble. Okay, so this code is going to violate safety properties. Okay, you will end up there at least some scenarios where you will end up with too much milk. Okay, so the code doesn't work. Okay, so next scenario is this one. So here we have uh, we are going to leave sort of nodes that are named. So here is thread A, it says you start by leaving a node, okay, then you check if thread B has left a node. If there is no node, then you go and check if there is no milk, and then you buy milk, and then you remove a node. Okay. Thread B does the same thing, it leaves a node with its name, signed node saying I'm leaving node B. So you did A leave a node, okay, and if not, you say there's no milk, etc. And now the question is, will this work? If yes, why? If not, why not? Yes. Okay. So the scenario that is being mentioned is there is at least one way to schedule them such that both threads will end up leaving nodes and not buying milk if there is no milk. Okay. The scheduling order would be as follows: thread A runs, it leaves node A. Okay. Time slice expires. So now it doesn't get in, even gone into the it just left a node. Okay. Thread B runs, okay, leaves a node, node B. Okay, that's the first statement. Its time slice expires. Okay. I will switch back to A. Okay. A is going to say, is there any node from B? And node B has left a node. So B, so so you see a node, so thread says B has left a node. I don't need to do anything. That thread is going to buy milk. Okay. So Basically, after you just check this if statement, it time slice expires again. You run this thread. It says, does A have a node? There is still a node. You haven't yet removed it. Okay, so B assumes that A is going to buy milk and does nothing. Okay? And then both A and B essentially don't go into the if they remove the node. Okay? So this could repeatedly occur where each thread leaves a node. Okay? The other thread checks and assumes that the other thread is going to do the work and nobody buys milk. So there's a scheduling order here where we have violated the liveness property. Nothing good is happening. Okay? They'll repeatedly leave notes and assume that the other person is going to do it. And now you are essentially not going to get milk at all. Okay? There is no safety violation yet, but there is a liveness violation. Okay? So you are going to keep doing this check and nothing good is happening. Okay. So scenario three. Okay, more complex. Okay, so now what we do is we leave a note. The, the code for the two threads are different. Until now we have the same code here. A and B are going to execute slightly different <coughs> pieces of code. So you leave a note and then you sit in a while loop. It says it has B left a note. Okay? And while there is a note, you essentially just do nothing. You sit in the loop and keep spinning. Okay? And then once you exit at the while loop, okay, you are guaranteed that there is no note at that point. Okay? Then you say, is there no milk? Okay? You buy milk okay? and then you remove your milk. Okay? So this code is the same as the previous code. Okay? You leave a node, check if there's the other thread has left a node okay? and then if not, you go buy milk. Okay? Asymmetric code. Does this work? Okay, so you have to, to understand what it does, you have to think of sort of what, how this would work in real life. Okay, instead of threads, if you have people, what has essentially happened is there's one of the, one of you, you or your roommate is more paranoid. So you leave a note and if the other person has left a note, you just stand near the fridge and see that there's milk eventually arrive or not. Okay, and if there is no milk, basically that's the while loop. But after the note is removed, you actually then check, is there milk? If there's no milk, you go buy it. So in the previous case, what happened is as soon as you saw the note, you assumed that the other thread will actually deliver milk and you did nothing, you just removed the note. Here, if you see a note, you actually wait. You say, I see a note, but I don't know if the other thread or my other roommate is actually going to do 
what he or she said they would do and you actually wait until the node is removed and then check has milk arrived or not. Okay, yes, there is a thing in the back somewhere. Okay, is that clear? Okay. So, I will claim or assert that this solution actually works. Okay, I gave you some intuitive idea of why it works. You have one thread that is more paranoid than the other. It's checking, it's not believing that the presence of a node implies that milk will eventually arrive. So actually waiting to make sure after the note has been removed whether milk was actually delivered and if not you then go and buy it. Okay. So if you write code the, that code it will actually work there is a sort of a more detailed explanation here which I am not going to go into because I gave you some intuition. Okay. But what I think we would we would like to understand okay, is that or not like to understand but we would like to sort of point out here is that although this code is correct. Okay. You have to think about this for a while to convince yourself this code is going to work and no matter how the CPU scheduler schedules this thread, no matter what happens, okay, the code will actually work and that is not easy to do okay, because first of all, this uh, the two threads are different pieces. Second of all, I think uh, the, you have to understand what might happen and reason about it and it takes a while. So, the code is correct, but it is complicated, it is hard to understand. Okay. So, if you are you, the application programmer, had to write code of this fashion for a slightly more complicated problem, your life would be much more difficult. Okay. So, we do not want to be writing sort of complicated code, especially when set threading and synchronization is concerned. Now, if you if we ask you to generalize this to three threads, there are three roommates who are all cooperating. This would be even more complicated because you would not be able to sort of generalize this easily. Okay, is that clear? Yes. Okay. So we would like to implement synchronization, but we don't like the complexity of what code one has to write to achieve the safety and liveness property. Okay. So that basically sort of leads to the discussion we need better primitives to implement this kind of problem. Yeah, so, it is too complicated, it is asymmetric. Okay, the, I did not point out the third problem with the code is thread A is busy waiting. Okay, it is sitting in a while loop just continuously checking for the node to disappear. Okay. So, sitting in a while loop just waiting for some condition to become true or, to, or to false is referred to as busy waiting. We are consuming CPU cycles without doing anything useful. Okay, yes, as a person you are just standing near the fridge for an hour, two hours waiting for the node to disappear and then check. Okay, while you just stand near the fridge nothing good is happening. In okay, so, so busy weight is bad, asymmetric code, complex code, all of these are actually not desirable properties from your code. Okay, so now we are going to look at synchronization primitives that allow us to solve this problem in a much more straightforward way and we can reason about the code and convince ourselves the code is actually going to work and okay, not this code that I just showed you which is much harder to convince ourselves. Okay. So, that is going to lead us to this discussion of three primitives, locks, semaphores and monitors. Presumably, you heard of at least one or more of these. I am going to reintroduce them. Okay, we will look at what they are and then we are going to see how to implement them. That is really the goal that we are building towards. Okay. Any questions so far? Which of these have you actually encountered in 2.30? Uh, at least locks and semaphores. They might have mentioned monitors, but I don't remember. Okay. So, we will go through all three of them. Okay. If you actually write Java code, this comes out of the box for you. So, I was assuming this you would have already known. If it's the other way around, that's not a problem. Okay. So, now the thing that to keep in mind is as we go through them and see how to implement them, you'll see that they all need some hardware support. Okay. They all need OS level support as well as hardware level support. Without hardware support, you cannot actually implement synchronization. You okay, will start with locks. Probably you know this already. Okay, lock is essentially a synchronization primitive to implement mutual exclusion okay, on shared data. Okay. It has two routines. Okay. There is an acquire routine or a method okay, that essentially says before you enter any critical section, you essentially acquire a lock. If you hold a lock, you are guaranteed the lock 
primitive guarantee is that no other thread will be given the lock while a thread holds it. Okay. So it can go and execute the critical section and there's a guarantee that no one else is allowed to execute it while the lock is in use. Okay. And once you're done executing the critical section, you are going to call lock release. So you always wrap your critical section with an acquire and a release. Acquire at the start and a release at the end. Yes. Okay. So question is, if you had a multi-core system, what would happen if you try to acquire the lock at the same time? Okay, the primitive as defined doesn't assume whether the underlying system is uniprocessor or multiprocessor or multi-core. It guarantees that even if multiple threads try to contend for the lock at the same time by calling acquire, only one of them will win. Okay, and whichever one wins gets to enter the critical section, the other threads have to wait. Okay. So this code, if you use locks, will work whether it's uniprocessor, real parallelism, multiprocessor, no matter what happens when you schedule them, the property is guaranteed that when you call acquire, okay, either you have to wait if the lock is in use or if it's not in use and you get the lock, then you are the only thread that will get it. Okay? It isn't, it's not the case that if you have multiple cores, then multiple threads will get the lock. So it guarantees this property. Okay? So very simple rules for using the lock, always acquire a lock before accessing shared data before entering a critical section, always release the lock after you finish. Initial lock state is free. Okay, this is now the code for too much milk okay. using locks. Okay. Single if statement. Okay. So, and you just have a lock acquire and a lock release. The if statement is simply going to say if there is no milk in the fridge, go buy milk. Okay. And when you have lock acquire at the beginning, lock release at the end. Okay. And lock acquire guarantees that one and only one thread will be in this part of the code. Okay. So we don't need to worry about what happens when you schedule or get uh, context switched out. None of that matters anymore because even if the CPU scheduler says the time slices up, some other thread is going to run. You are guaranteed by the lock primitive that if this thread has acquired the lock, only that thread can execute this code, which is atomically check that there is no milk, go buy milk, deliver the milk. So all of that happens as one critical section and while this is happening, no one else can do it. And this is like if you decide that you want to go buy milk, you actually lock your dorm. So no one even gets to enter and check anything, whether there is milk or not. And you open the door only after you brought milk. Okay, so it's guaranteed that no one else is going to go buy milk if they cannot even enter your room to check them. Okay, that's sort of the equivalent. Okay. Simple code, clean, okay. so just one line, and you acquire sort of, a, not acquire, so all the too much problem. So the thread will still get uh, scheduled on the CPU? Yes, so we'll assume that threads are scheduled, it doesn't matter what scheduling policy is used, okay. you could be context switched out, so for instance, thread A runs, you acquire a lock, okay. you get, and then you enter here, and then you are context switched out. Okay. Thread B runs, it's going to try to acquire the lock, but now the lock is already in use. Okay? So it will actually run, but then it will immediately block here. Okay? It will be asked to wait, saying the lock is in use, you cannot actually proceed, you have to block okay, until the lock is released. That's the primitive, that's what the primitive does. So now it doesn't matter who, who runs in what order. Some thread is going to enter, okay? whichever one runs first is going to enter the critical section by grabbing the lock. Everyone else has to wait. Okay, doesn't matter how they are scheduled because they have to wait, they cannot enter, so they cannot actually do any of these operations. So after if thread A gets to enter first, it's going to execute all of this code and only when it calls lock release will thread B be allowed to proceed. But then the lock is free again and thread B will be given the lock. But now when it enters, thread A has done all of the work. Okay? It's checked, it's bought milk if it needs to buy milk and so you will enter here and you will basically say now there is milk, so there's nothing to do. Okay. So bad things cannot happen here, safety is guaranteed by the lock, liveness is also guaranteed because every thread is actually checking okay, after acquiring the lock. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so we haven't yet studied how to implement locks, this is just how to use a lock to write some code okay, and implement synchronization. Okay, is there any question before I talk about how to implement locks? Is this clear? This probably is something you must have looked at in 2.30.
yes, question. Uh, by synchronization, you mean like if there was stuff before the lock and after the lock, then it would be synchronous, right? Because the way it stands right now, it's not really synchronous at all. So synchronization essentially means that if you are executing some code, mm -hmm. your synchronization at high level means co cooperating threads. Okay, they are actually coordinating on some task. Here, the threads are trying to coordinate or synchronize the process of buying milk. Because if you don't synchronize, each thread does its own thing, you may end up with too much milk or no milk. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant both running at the same time. By yes. So synchronization involves concurrency in this case because we're assuming that one way to achieve this is to not even run thread A. You don't even start it until you do. It. So we'll assume threads run synchronously and yet you want the liveness and safety properties. Okay, so both threads are going to run at the same time. Doesn't matter whether it's one core or multiple cores, they will be concurrent. Okay? And you want to implement this as a, as a critical section or implement mutual exclusion as part of synchronization. Mutual exclusion says if some ta if some thread is doing a task, it wants to actively prevent other ta ta threads from uh, implementing or executing the same task. That's the only way you are going to get correctness properties. Saying, I am going off and buying milk, don't bother, okay, or wait. That's what we are going to say. Okay? So these threads will run, yeah, they'll get scheduled, but if one thread is in the critical section, other threads will not be allowed to enter the critical. That is how we are going to achieve synchronization for this task. Does that answer your question? Okay, so what saying, happens before and after is not material for the solution of the problem. Okay, there may be code here, there is code here. I'm just right. saying because the entire thread is the critical section, right. they aren't making any progress at the same time. Yes, so, it, so your point is if this is, I have only shown the part of the problem where you have locks. There is probably stuff that this threads have to do before and after. Those would not be in a lock. So those would run concurrently. Only parts where you actually have to enter a critical section, you will not have that mm -hmm. property that they'll run at the same time. Okay. In fact, synchronization involves not running at the same time and doing certain things. That's the point of synchron. That's the only way we let you synchronization. Okay. Doesn't mean that there is no other code that we cannot execute concurrently. Okay. You may be able to do that without using locks. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so we are now going to look at how to implement the acquire and release method. How does it guarantee us that if one thread has a lock, no one else can actually enter the critical section that they block. Okay, so we will look at uh, several different uh, hardware mechanisms, actually two in this class. Okay, one is uh, basically we look at how do you use interrupts as a way to implement lock methods. We will also look at atomic operations. Okay, specifically, we look at test and set uh, as a way to implement some of these atomic operations. When we were doing the uh, architecture review, I think it was lecture 2, I said that there is something called a test and set instruction uh, that's a special instruction that's supported by CPUs that enables us to implement synchronization. And I thought when we talk about synchronization, we are going to go and look at that uh, instruction and see how to use it. Okay, that's what we are going to do today. Okay, but first we are going to use the first method which is in disabling interrupts and see how to implement a lock. Then we look at the second method and we put actually three different implementations of locks that we are going to study. Okay? Two using test and set and one using disabling and enabling interrupts. Okay, so, so let's ask the question, if you had the ability to disable interrupts, how would you implement synchronization. How we would implement locks? Okay, remember, to implement locks, you have to implement two methods, the acquire method and the release method. Okay. The acquire method has to guarantee that if some, if a lock is in use, then any other thread that calls the acquire method is made to wait. It's blocked. And if the lock is not in use, the acquire method simply grants that lock to the requesting thread and lets that thread continue. That's how you want to implement the acquire method. Okay. And you want to ensure atomicity, which is no matter what happens, how things get scheduled, etc., you are going to not have uh, the problem of uh, having multiple threads in the critical section. Okay. So we, one way to implement this is to somehow disable the bad effects of CPU scheduling. Okay. We said bad things happen if the CPU scheduler context switches out and runs another thread. 
So one way is we'll say, if some thread is in the critical section, let us temporarily disable context switching. Let us not let this thread actually be switched out. Let it implement or run through its critical section. Only then should we let it switch out. This is one way to do things. Okay? And that is something we can achieve by disabling interrupts. Okay, so we can ask, how, what are the ways by which a CPU scheduler actually gets to run and pick another thread? Okay. One is the thread actually does some I.O. Okay, you are in a time slice, thread does I.O. Thread gives up the CPU, CPU scheduler runs, picks another thread. Okay. So we'll say if you want to then uh, not give up the CPU, do not do I.O. in the midst of a critical section. Then the CPU scheduler cannot take away the CPU because this thread did I.O. Okay. That's the first condition we are going to impose. The second way you can actually give control to the CPU scheduler is that an interrupt goes off. Okay? The timer goes off and says the time slice has ended. There is some other hardware interrupt that has actually occurred that also lets uh, the OS take control. Okay? So if an interrupt goes off which is a time slice expire or some other hardware interrupt arrives again you are essentially going to take control from the thread and let the kernel run and the CPU scheduler will eventually run. Right? We can disable that from occurring as well okay? by essentially disabling it. Okay? So on a unique processor, we'll say first let's assume that the, if you are inside a critical section, you will not do any I/O and give control to the CPU scheduler. So don't request I/O operation inside a critical section because okay? that's a rule we have to enforce. Okay? And second is we will not let even if a timer expires or a hardware interrupt comes, we will prevent the OS from taking control. Right? And the way we will do it is we will explicitly disable interrupts. Okay? The hardware allows you to either mask or disable interrupts temporarily. When you disable interrupts, even when an interrupt occurs, you are not going to actually, this is equivalent of a trap, you are not going to suspend execution of the process. You are going to make the interrupt wait. Okay? So you can use that hardware feature and prevent the scheduler from running. If you do this, then you are guaranteed that when this code is executing, nothing else can take over. And you have to be very careful because now you are even preventing the OS from taking over. In some sense. So essentially you want to do this only inside the OS. You don't want an application process to disable interrupts and then just take over the machine because now the CPU cannot, I mean the CPU scheduler cannot evict that process anymore. Okay. Yes, question. So trap, so question is will the CPU still be able to draw a trap? So you will actually have traps, you will have interrupts coming, but if you have masked or disabled them, they will either be ignored depending on what the architecture does or they will be queued. Okay. Okay. If your hardware is designed such that when you disable interrupts, they are ignored, then the thing just disappears. You may have a trap, but you just ignore it. It is lost. Okay. More modern CPUs will queue it saying there is an interrupt but currently interrupts are disabled so I cannot interrupt the current process. I will wait until interrupts are re-enabled and then process that trap or interrupt. Right? So if you queue the interrupt then you will, it will get processed but at a later time not immediately. Okay? So you don't want to do this for long periods of time. You don't want to do this uh, mm -hmm. uh, or have, have application processes do this. Okay? Because this is something that is actually causing hardware to behave differently from the normal behavior. But it is something you may have to do to implement synchronization. Okay, so now I will show you an example implementation of logs that simply uses enabling and disabling of interrupts to achieve its tasks. Okay. So this is the log implementation. This is the log class. It has two methods, acquire and release. Okay. Two, and there are two private things, private variables. One is the value of the log, which is a binary value. Either the log is available or free. I'm sorry, available or in use. Okay. Available and free are the same thing. Okay, so value if it's zero, you say it's uh, available, okay, meaning it's free. And if the lock is in use, you set it to one. A binary variable that tells what the lock condition is. And we'll associate a queue with the lock. Okay. If some process calls acquire and the lock is in use, the process is queued. So you have to wait and we'll put it on the queue. Okay. This is equivalent to your wait queue that you had for each I.O. device. If you remember I said there are these process states when the process does I.O. it goes into a wait queue. Okay? You have wait queues for for locks and semaphores as well. Okay? Because equivalent you are waiting, you are blocked waiting for some of the lock to be released. Okay? So this is where we will queue up this process. 
okay, on this key. Okay. This is the constructor for your method. You initialize the lock to be free. Q is empty when you start off. Okay. Here is your acquire method. Okay. Acquire method simply says this is essentially a system call. So this is inside a kernel. Okay. So the kernel when you call acquire, okay, the system call first thing kernel says let's disable interrupts. Okay. Now this is a critical section. So nothing can interrupt whether interrupts come or not doesn't matter anymore. They are queued or ignored. Okay, then you check the value of the lock. The lock is in use. Okay, then you say this thread that called acquire must wait because some other thread holds the lock. Okay, so you will simply add the thread to this queue or the lock and you put the thread to sleep. Okay, and you will enable interrupts. If this lock thread called acquire, lock is in use, wait. Okay, and this is done atomically because between enable and disable interrupt, nothing can actually switch out of this. It doesn't matter what's happening in the system. Okay. Now, if the value was initially not busy, okay, then we'll be, what we'll simply do is just switch the variable from free to busy, saying the lock is in use and simply let the thread continue. Okay, it's called acquire, it has been granted the lock, so it doesn't need to wait. So the else part just simply switches the lock state from free to busy and let the thread continue. So it has actually gets to enter the critical section without waiting. Okay? So only one or two things happen in require. Either you are asked to wait, if the lock is in use, or you are allowed to continue if the lock is free. Okay? Very simple code. Only thing is you have to wrap it by this enabling and disabling interrupts. Okay? Special instructions that the kernel executes. Okay? Release is very straightforward. Okay? You again disable interrupts, and then first thing, whenever a lock uh, is being released, okay, what do you do? Okay, you should basically say, is there some other thread waiting for the lock? So you check if the queue is not empty, then you basically let give the lock to one of the waiting threads. Okay, so thread A called release and the system call is checking first whether some other thread is waiting. If so, you take the thread of the queue, uh, of the wait queue and you put it on the ready queue so it's ready to run. Okay, it has been given the lock. And if the queue is empty, there's no other thread waiting, then you just switch the lock state from busy to free. Okay, you call release, there's no thread waiting, so just switch the uh, thing back to free and you enable interrupts. Okay. Again, this code is going to execute unhindered because there is interrupts being disabled between here. So no matter what else is happening, it's executing atomically, which means that nothing can interrupt it while it's executing. Okay, so you can assume that you will not be switched out or anything will happen while that code executes. Okay. So this is one way you can implement your lock methods using kernel support. It's typically done as system calls in this case. Yes, User probes, so questions, can user programs implement locks? In this case, we are assuming you need kernel support. So user program can call lock acquire and lock release, but the, ex uh, the lock acquire and lock release are system calls. So this code is executing in the kernel. Okay. Now, you ask the question, can user program implement locks? Not, typically you don't want to give enabling and disabling interrupts, uh, the sort of control over them to user processes. We'll see another example which uses test and set. It's not a privileged operation that you can use in libraries to implement locks. Okay, so you can implement lock, but this is the wrong way to do it because it gives user processes control or interrupts. Okay, if you disable interrupts, you can take over the machine because nothing else can run while the dis interrupts are disabled, not even the kernel. Okay, if the process actually disabled it. Okay, so this is a good for an in-kernel implementation. We'll see other implementations that you can implement in a library okay, and implement locks. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so I'm going to ignore these two and then go those two slides and go to the next implementation, which is to use atomic instruction. Okay? So you could use interrupts okay, to implement a lock uh, method, but that requires that kernel level support, sometimes you may implement the system calls, but often you may have to implement locks as libraries. Okay, you know, in Java, right, the locks are actually implemented by the JVM in the user process. They may not require kernel level support. So how do you do this? The way you do this, you still need hardware level support. Okay? In this case, we are going to use a special instruction. Okay? The, the class of instructions that 
we can use or refer to as read modify write instructions and we'll use this test and set as an example of this instruction okay? so what does instructions do is in one clock cycle in a single instruction you can read the value of a variable okay you can modify the value and write it back in a single atomic instruction okay? typically you what you may have to do otherwise is you can say uh, you read a value okay? so let's say a variable is i you say read something okay? and then you check if that value is some of some constant c and then you can modify it or set it to some other value okay so if you wanted to read the value of a variable modify it and write it back typically that requires you to use multiple assembly instructions to do okay what read modify write instructions do is in a single atomic instruction in a single assembly instruction you can do all those three steps in one shot and by doing so we will be able to achieve atomicity and implement locks and critical section we'll see how in just a moment for now just try to understand what this instruction does okay it's a single assembly instruction okay and in the, what it does is it reads the value whatever value of variable you specify reads this value it modifies it to whatever you want and it writes it back okay in one instruction here are some examples okay now this works whether you do it on a uniprocessor or multiprocessors <laughs> a uniprocessor is straightforward to implement a single instruction on multi core or multi processor system you want to ensure that if the value of the variable is cached somewhere caches are invalidated it's little more complicated because you have to ensure if uh, it's cached you do not have bad things to happen you do not want bad things to happen okay but we'll ignore that uh, nuance for a moment okay let us just try to understand what instruction simplest form of a read modify write instruction is referred to as a test and set okay so you can just say test and set i okay this is the way you would use that assembly instruction what it simply does is it reads the value of i returns it okay and writes one back to i okay it's simply going to read i and write a reset i to one okay read i and return it and <coughs> write one back Okay, the normal way to use it is if I will can initialize i to zero, and if you do test and set i, it will tell you what the current value is and change the value to one. It flip it to one. If it's already one, it'll flip it by. We'll flip it, but it'll stay one. Okay, is that clear? Yes or no? Okay. So it's a, a instruction that's going to do this in one clock cycle. It's a single atomic instruction. Okay, and we'll see how to use it. Okay, there are other equivalent versions of this. One is called exchange, which is a, a, on Intel architectures. It swaps a value atomically between a register and memory. Okay, it reads the value from memory, reads the value of the variable, stores it in a register, takes the value in the register, stores it back. Okay. Same thing. You could have stored one in the register. Okay, and then so you read i, and then you take the value of i, put it in the register, take the register value, and write one back. Okay, so. you can essentially do the same test and set using exchange compare and swap will basically do the same thing right just another name for test and set okay, so we are going to ignore the other nuances just focus on one they are all equivalent so we'll say let's just assume your hardware supports test and set as an assembly instruction how can we implement locks using test and set is the problem clear what we want to achieve we want to use this hardware feature and implement locks yes would one be um lock when the value is one and then i value is one does that mean uh, the lock is set and yes and it's something else it's unlocked yeah. so we want to use exactly what you said we want to use the value of the lock whether it's free or not that's a binary variable we are going to somehow use the test and set to atomically flip it okay so this is the implementation yeah, the require is on the next slide so same thing the require and release is a value okay which is set to zero in the constructor and the code is very simple okay you will say while test and set value equal to equal to 1 while the test so while the lock is busy do nothing sit and wait 
of that loop, then basically you are done. Okay, release is just going to reset the value to 0. Okay. Now, this does not require kernel level support because the hardware has actually given you that instruction. So, you implemented the acquire method using one line of code, which you are simply sitting in a while loop waiting for the value to be 0. Okay. That check is atomic. Okay. So, initially, let's say the value was 0. What would test and set do? Okay. Test and set on value would return a 0 to you. I said it will read the value, which is 0, return it to you, and set it to 1 in a single clock cycle. So, you will take the value of 0, you will return it and set the lock to 1. Okay. So that condition will fail. 0 is not equal to equal to 1 because you are returning 0. And the first thread that calls acquire is going to succeed and enter the critical section and in doing so it would have flipped the value to 1 from 0. Okay. Now the lock value is 1. So any subsequent thread that comes along and calls acquire is just going to sit in this while loop and spin. Because the value is 1, so if you do test and set on value, it's going to return 1. And it will basically try to write 1 back, which is not going to change the value. So, you'll just sit there in the while loop waiting. So, you're not going to go past the acquire method, you're just going to sit here. Okay? Until the first thread that got the acquire is going to call release and change the value to 0. Okay, yes. That doesn't, this uh, defeat the purpose of of the lock because it has a it has a while loop that's operating every every clock cycle and then you're still burning cycles. Okay, so good point. The point is, does it defeat the purpose of a lock because you are sitting in a while loop and spinning? Okay, so we will first ask, is this correct? Okay, and how does it give? And then we the second we'll ask, is this an efficient implementation? What you are pointing out is it's not an efficient implementation. So we we'll try to fix it. Okay, but let us first convince ourselves that this is going to work, no matter how. So now we are not in kernel land anymore. These are user processes. This could be an implementation that you write in your code. It could be a library has written this code for you and you are simply calling an acquire on a lock method. Okay. So it doesn't, what we have to convince ourselves, it doesn't matter in how the CPU scheduler schedules these processes or threads, you will still have correct behavior. And the reason you get correct behavior is because test and set is a single assembly instruction. You can execute it and flip the value in one cycle. Okay. So if you execute it, okay, you are done. You either enter or you don't enter. So even if you get context switched out right after you do this, you already reset the value. So it doesn't matter what you do. If these are multiple instructions, if you, this was an if statement saying if the value equal to equal to uh, zero, then it's change it. Okay. Those would be two separate instructions, you would have the same problem as too much milk. You would first check the value, you may get switched out, somebody else could enter. Okay. So realize that because this is happening in a single instruction, all of those bad behavior that we saw in too much milk will not exist anymore. You cannot just check the if statement and then try to change the value and get context switch in between. All of that is happening for you in one clock cycle. Okay, so either it all happens or it doesn't happen, you haven't even executed it. Okay. So this simple hardware level support will help us implement the lock primitive and get correct behavior. Okay, is that clear, that correctness? So you understand how test and set works, right? So you are going to basically, all this is doing is it's going to read the value and think of this as a function that reads the value returns that value and then changes it back to 1 as a single assembly instruction. Okay, so test and set is going to return the current value of that variable, okay, whether it's 0 or 1. And then you just compare and see whether you want to spin or you let the process or thread continue. Okay, so now we'll come to the, the point that was being raised, which is this is the acquire method, okay, which is essentially a while loop. So we'll say that this is a correct implementation, but it's not an efficient one because it involves busy waiting. Okay, busy waiting is a term which says that you're sitting in a while loop. Okay, so it, the thread is very busy, but it's just waiting. It's doing nothing, nothing useful because it's just sitting there and keep you keep checking in this while loop. Is the lock free? Is the lock free? Is the lock free? They're just doing this and not achieving anything useful. So, busy waiting is not a desirable property, it wastes CPU cycles. You would have rather liked to put that thread to sleep somehow. 
Okay, saying rather than checking, you just go to sleep and the lock is released, we'll wake you up. That is a better implementation. That is what we did for interrupts. Okay, we check the value and we put the thread to sleep. Okay, test and set is a different implementation that doesn't do that. You're just continuously checking. So it is a correct implementation. Doesn't need hardware level support, but yet you have to now somehow figure out how to uh, address this issue okay, because it involves busy waiting. Okay, is that clear? What we said? Okay. Here is another implementation of uh, test and set. This does require a little bit of kernel level support because it involves some sleeping. Okay. Or you need a sleep method to be exposed, which many OSs do as system calls. So you can use that to implement it as well. Okay. So here is what we are going to do. Okay. Rather than using test and set to check the value of a lock, Okay, which is what we did in the previous implementation, we are going to use the test and set as a guard instruction. Okay? A guard instruction just says, should the process wait at this point or should it continue? Okay? So we are going to actually have a second uh, variable. There is a value of the lock and we have a second variable called guard. Okay? And we are going to simply use the guard to ensure that only one thread gets to even implement, enter, acquire at any given time. Okay. So all you are doing is initially guard is set to zero, the constructor is missing. Okay. So guard is set to zero initially. So the first thread that comes in, you will say test and set guard, okay. guard is zero. So test and set will change the value of guard to one okay. and that first thread will just continue. Okay. It will not wait here. Okay. And then here all you are doing is you are checking, is the value free, if it's not free then grab the lock if it's uh, or rather if it's free grab the lock if it's not free then put this thread on a queue and make it sleep <coughs> wait okay. so this code actually looks like the disabling interrupts code in fact it is the disabling interrupts code except that you're not disabling interrupts you're using test and set to prevent multiple threads from implement from, from executing acquire at the same time you're ensuring that only one thread will actually uh, execute acquire. That is what disabling interrupts did as well. Okay. So by disabling interrupts, you explicitly prevented the CPU scheduler from running. And by doing so, you prevented the scheduler from scheduling another thread which you could have called acquire at the same time. Okay, so you implicitly prevented another thread from calling acquire by preventing the scheduler from running at all. Here, it doesn't matter. The scheduler can run and it can schedule other threads. But the guard statement is going to prevent some other thread from running or uh, not running but from entering acquire. Okay. So let's ask what happened. Let's say the thread A has entered uh, acquire and it's basically set the guard value to 1. Okay. While it is actually inside the acquire method, let's say CPU scheduler runs. Mm -hmm. Context switches this thread out. Another thread runs and calls acquire. What will happen? Okay, so suggestion or not suggestion, comment is that any thread that calls acquire while the first thread is inside acquire will basically sit and spin here. Are people convinced that's what's going to happen? Yes or no? Okay, so you can run through the code again and understand. Right? So what does test and set do? It returns the value of the specified variable and resets it to 1. Initially, the variable is 0. Okay, so, when the first thread is going to call acquire, you will do while test and set guard. Okay, that test and set will return 0 because the value of guard is 0 and the value will be flipped to 1. Okay, so, 0 is not equal to equal to 1. So, this condition is going to fail and the first thread is going to enter the acquire method and it's going to be checking something here. Okay. Now we'll say while that happens, arbitrary things can happen. Scheduler may run. It may run thread B. Thread B also called lock acquire. Okay. So that thread will now enter this acquire method and it will say test and set on guard. Okay. Thread A has set the guard value to 1. So test and set guard is going to now return 1. 
and so this condition is true at this point so you are going to sit there and spin okay so you'll sit and spin while the first thread is in this section and it is once it has actually exited okay and then you're basically when you exit you always reset the guard so you'll see that in both the if and the else the guard is actually set to zero so you have exited you set the guard to zero at that point the thread b is going to enter okay so we are explicitly preventing so think of the guard as a sort of a security guard who's sitting standing outside the room allows only one person to enter the room at any given time that is essentially what this statement is doing allows only one thread to enter at any given time if the room is in use the guard prevents any other persons from entering the room if the thread is actually in, a, in that method other threads are prevented from entering the method so that is why it's called a guard statement is guarding other threads from entry very standard primitive uh, that is used for synchronization of this stuff okay. the release is the same okay. you are basically going to essentially have guard there okay. and this part is the same if the queue is when you are releasing the lock you check if this is a non empty queue you give the lock to one of the waiting threads if the queue is empty no other threads wants the lock then you set the lock to be available or free So what observations can we make here of this implementation and compare it to the previous implementation which was that? Yes. Okay, so first is while the lock is actually in use, you are not sitting in space in a while. Okay, because you are going to put, if the lock is in use, you are going to put the thread on a wait queue and put it to sleep. Okay. First observation. Any other observations here? Yes. It's still wasting a lot of time for that. Okay. So you should say, wait a minute. So you didn't do a while here, but you are sitting and spinning here. Okay. The previous implementation was actually spinning on the value or on a test and set on value, you are doing a busy wait on guard. So you can say, why is this any better? Rather than doing busy wait on one variable, you are doing a busy wait on another variable. So does it help? Yes. Uh, assuming that the time it takes to lock and unlock is a lot less than the size of your critical section, it helps. Okay. So one point being made is, in the first case, you are waiting for the lock to be free. You are busy waiting for the lock to be available. Okay? That's what you are waiting. In this case, you are just waiting for some other thread to finish executing this small piece of code. Okay? What is inside a critical section could be arbitrary. Once you grab a lock, you may take 10 seconds, you may take 3 seconds, you may take an arbitrary amount of time before you release the lock. So, you are busy waiting for that whole time. The amount of time it takes to execute this code is bounded because you are simply doing a few simple statements here. Okay? So the point that you want to take away is you are busy waiting, but you are busy waiting on a fairly small piece of code. If you are busy waiting on the lock, then you may end up waiting for an arbitrary period of time until the lock is being released. Okay? So we will refer to this as minimal busy waiting. Okay? We cannot avoid busy waiting in this case. Test and set inherently involves some form of busy waiting. The only thing we can do is minimize the amount of time you are sitting and spinning. Okay. Here you are sitting and spinning until some thread that has actually entered this piece of code has exited. Okay, there are just four or five statements. Okay. Hopefully it won't take a long time regardless how things are scheduled and so on. In the previous case, you have to wait until whatever has acquired the lock. So if it was too much milk, you have to wait until you go to the grocery, come back and put the fridge in the milk and then the lock is released. And maybe a long time okay, to enter or so execute a large piece of code. So this code has busy waiting. Okay? We did not eliminate it. We could not eliminate it. Okay? So that problem still exists, but we minimized its impact. We reduced the problems busy waiting can cause. We reduced the CPU cycles that are being wasted. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. So the things to take away, test and set, 
you will have to do some form of busy waiting. The previous implementation much simpler, one line of code, but involves a lot of busy wait. Okay, waste CPU cycle. This is a more efficient implementation, but still we have not gotten rid of it. Okay, both the acquire and the release have a guard so that only one thread can be either in acquire or release at any given time. But both of these are short functions. So presumably the time it takes whenever some other thread is in this function, the time it takes for that function to exit is small. So you won't busy wait for a long period. And as a result, you won't waste too much CPU cell. You waste a little bit. Okay. So that's basically where we will end today. Okay. So our what we have gone through is the notion of a critical section and synchronization and we looked at two implementations. Keep this in mind. There is an interrupt with using interrupts to implement locks and we use test and set also to implement. So what we will do next time is look at semaphores and monitors. Understand what they are and again try to come up with similar implementation. How does a library or an OS actually implement these primitives? Okay, so that is basically what is coming uh, next time. Okay, so today we will stop here.